Hello, lovely people. We um, are reading I Know Why the Caged Bird Sings. And yesterday we stopped um, while my Angelo's mother's boyfriend, um, evil, nasty, demented man um, was in the middle of raping her. Now this isn't gonna hurt you much. You liked it before, didn't you? I didn't want to admit that I had in fact liked his holding me or that I had felt like his smell or the hard heart beating or that I had liked his smell or the hard heart beating. So I said nothing. And his face became like the face of one of those mean natives, those phantoms always having to, I'm sorry. And his face became like one of those mean natives, the phantom was always having to beat up. His legs were squeezing my waist. Pull down your drawers. I hesitated for two reasons. He was holding me too tight to move and I was sure that any minute my mother or Bailey or the Green Hornet would bust through the door and save me. We was just playing before. He released me enough to snatch down my bloomers, and then he dragged me closer to him. Turning the radio up loud, too loud, he said, if you scream, I'm gonna kill you, and if you tell, I'm gonna kill Bailey. I could tell he meant what he said. I couldn't understand why he wanted to kill my brother. Neither of us had done anything to him. And then, then there was the pain, a breaking and entering, when even the scenes are torn, when even the senses are torn apart. The act of rape on an eight-year-old body is a matter of the needle giving because the camel can't. The child gives because the body can, and the mind of the violator cannot. I thought, I thought I had died. I woke up in a white walled world and it had to be heaven, but Mr. Freeman was there and he was washing me. His hands shook and he held me upright in the tub and washed my legs. I didn't mean to hurt you, Reedy. I didn't mean it, but don't you tell. Remember, don't you tell a soul. I felt cool and very clean and just a little tired. No, sir, Mr. Freeman, I won't tell. And I was somewhere above everything. It's just that I'm so tired. I'll just go and lay down a while, please, I whispered to him. I thought if I spoke loud, he might become frightened and hurt me again. He dried me and handed me my bloomers. Put these on and go to the library. Your, mama, your mama ought to be coming home soon. You just act natural. I was walking down the street and I felt the wet on my pants and my hips seemed to be coming out of their sockets and I couldn't sit long on the hard seats in the library. They had been constructed for children so I walked by the empty lot where Bailey was playing ball but he wasn't there. I stood for a while playing ball but I didn't see him and I watched the big boys tear around the dusty diamond and then headed home. After two blocks, I knew I'd never make it, not unless I counted my every step, then stepped on every crack, and I started to burn between my legs more and more. The time I'd wasted, mm, the time I'd wasted Sloan's liniment on myself, my legs throbbed, or rather my insides of my thighs throbbed with the same force that Mr. Freeman's heart had beaten. Thrum, step, thrum, step, step on the crack, Thrum, step, thrum, step. I went up the stairs one at a time, one at a time. No one was in the living room, so I went straight to bed after hiding my red and yellow stained drawers under the mattress. When mother came in, she said, well, young lady, I believe this is the first time I've seen you go to bed without being told. You must be sick. I wasn't sick, but the pit of my stomach was on fire how could I tell her that? Bailey came in later and asked me what the matter was. There was nothing to tell him. When mother called us to eat, 
when I said I wasn't hungry, she laid her cool hand on my, hand on my forehead. Maybe it's the measles. They say you're just going around the neighborhood. After she took my temperature, she said, you have a little fever. You probably just caught them. Mr. Freeman took up the whole doorway. Then Bailey ought not to be in there with her unless you want the house full of sick children. She answered over her shoulder. He may as well have them now as later. Get them over with. She brushed by Mr. Freeman as if he were made of cotton. Come on, Junior. Get some cool towels and wipe your sister's face. As Bailey left the room, Mr. Freeman advanced to the bed. He leaned over his whole face, threatened. It could have smothered me. If you tell, and again so softly, I almost didn't hear it. If you tell. I couldn't sum up the energy to answer him. He had to know that I wasn't going to tell anything. Bailey came in with the towels and Mr. Freeman walked out. Later, Mother made a broth and sat on the edge of my bed to feed me. The liquid went down my throat like bones. My belly had been... My belly and behind were as heavy as cold iron, but it seemed that my head had gone away and pure air had replaced it on my shoulders. Bailey read to me from the River Boys until he got sleepy and then he went to bed. That night I kept waking to hear Mother and Mr. Freeman arguing. I couldn't hear what they were saying, but I did hope that she wouldn't make him so mad that he'd come in and hurt her too. I knew that he could do it with his cold face and his empty eyes. Their voices came in faster and faster, the high sounds on the hills of the lows. I would have liked to have gone in, just passed through as if I were going to the toilet, just to show my face that they might stop, but my legs refused to move. I could move the toes and the ankles and the knees, but they felt like wood. Maybe I slept, but soon morning was there and mother was pretty over my bed. How you feeling, baby? Fine, mother, I said instinctively. Where's Bailey? She said he was still asleep, but that he hadn't slept, that she hadn't slept all night. She had been in my room off and on to see about me. I asked her where Mr. Freeman was, and she said her face chilled, and her face chilled with remembered anger. He's gone. He moved this morning. I'm going to take your temperature after I put on your cream of wheat. Can I tell her now? The terrible pain allured me, and I couldn't tell. What he did to me, and what I allowed, must have been very bad if already God had let me hurt so much. If Mr. Freeman was gone, did that mean Bailey was gone out of danger? And if so, if I told him, would he still love me? After Mother took my temperature, she said that she was going to bed for a while, but to wake her if I felt sicker. She told Bailey to wash my face and arms for spots, watch my face and arms for spots, and when they came up, he could paint them with calamine lotion. That Sunday goes and comes in my memory, like a bad connection on an overseas telephone call. Once Bailey was reading the kid's journal to me, and then without pause for sleeping, mother was looking closely at my face and soup trickled down my chin and some got on my mouth and I choked. And then there was a doctor who took my temperature and held my wrist. Bailey! I, was, I supposed I had screamed for him, materialized. Suddenly he was there and I asked him to help me and we'd run away to California or France or Chicago. I knew that I was dying and in fact, I longed for death, but I didn't want to die anywhere near Mr. Freeman. I knew that even now he wouldn't have allowed death to have me unless he wished it to have me. Mother said I should be bathed and the linens had to be changed since there was so much sweat. But then when they tried to move me, I fought and even Bailey couldn't hold me. Then she picked me up in her arms and the tear abated for a while. Bailey began to change the bed and he pulled off the soiled sheets, he dis the dislodged panties I had put underneath the mattress, and they fell at mother's feet. Chapter 13. In the hospital, Bailey told me that I had to tell who did that to me, or the man would hurt other little girls. When I explained that I couldn't tell because the man would kill him, Bailey said knowingly, he can't kill me, I won't let him kill me. 
And of course, I believed him. Bailey didn't lie to me. He never lied to me. So I told him. Bailey cried at the side of my bed until I started to cry too. Almost 15 years passed before I saw my brother cry again. Using the old brain he was born with, those were his words later on that day, he gave the information to my grandmother Baxter and Mr. Freeman was arrested and spared the awful wrath of my pistol whipping uncles. I would have liked to stay in the hospital the rest of my life. Mother brought flowers and candy. Grandmother came with fruit and my uncles clumped around and around my bed, snorting like wild horses. When they were able to speak, when they were able to sneak Bailey in, he read to me for hours. The saying that people who have nothing to do with the saying that the people who have nothing to do become body body busy bodies is not the only truth. I'm sorry, I'm gonna read that again. The saying that people who have nothing to do become busybodies is not the only truth. Excitement is a drug, and people whose lives are filled with violence are always wondering where the next fix was coming from. The court was filed. Some people even stood behind the church-like benches in a roar. Overhead fans moved with the detachment of old men. Grandmother Baxter's clients were there in gay and flippant array. The gamblers in the pinstripe suits and... Their makeup deep women whispered to me out of the blood red mouths. And now that I knew as much as they did, and I was eight years old and grown, even the nurses in the hospital had told me now that I had nothing to fear. The worst is over for you, honey, they said. So put the words in all that. So I put the words in all the smickering mouths. I sat with my family and Bailey couldn't come to court. And they rested still on the seats of their solid, gray-cold tombstones, thick with forevermore unmoving. Poor Mr. Freeman twisted in his chair to look. Hmm. Poor Mr. Freeman twisted in his chair to look empty threats over to me. He didn't know that he couldn't kill Bailey. Bailey, not Bailey. Bailey didn't lie to me. What was the defendant wearing? That was Mr. Freeman's lawyer asking me. I don't know, I said. You mean you say this man raped you and you don't know what he was wearing? He snickered as if I had raped Mr. Freeman instead. Do you know if you were even raped, he asked me. A sound pushed in the air of the court. I was sure it was laughter. I was glad that mother had let me wear the navy blue winter coat with the brass buttons that day. Although it was too short and the weather was typical, St. Louis hot. The coat was a friend that had hugged me in this strange and unfriendly place. Was that the first time you, the accused touched you? The question stopped me. Mr. Freeman had surely done something very wrong, but I was convinced that I had helped him do it. I didn't want to lie, but the lawyer wouldn't let me think, so I used silence as a retreat. Did the accused try to touch you before the time? Or rather, the time you say that he raped you? I couldn't say yes and tell him how I, he had loved me once, and for a few minutes how he had held me close before he thought that I had peed in the bed. My uncles would kill me if grandmother and grandmother Baxter would stop speaking to me very often if they thought that I was peeing in the bed. And all those people in the court would stone me as they had stoned the harlot in the Bible, and mother, who thought I was such a good girl, would be so disappointed if she thought I liked it. But most important, there was Bailey. I had to keep a big secret from him. So she's speaking about how, you know, just the confusion of being hugged by Mr. Freeman and um, yet being hugged softly before he raped her. And she's feeling confused and guilty about liking that hug and that physical affection. Marguerite answered the question, did the accused touch you before the occasion on which you claimed he raped you? Everyone in the court knew that the answer had to be no, everyone except Mr. Freeman and me. I looked at the heavy face trying to look as if he would have liked me to say no, and I said no. The lie jumped in my throat and I couldn't get air. How I despised the man for making me lie. 
old mean nasty thing, old black nasty thing. The tears didn't soothe my heart as they usually did. I screamed, old mean dirty thing, you dirty old thing. Our lawyer brought me off the stand and to my mother's arms. The fact that I had arrived at the, my desired destination by lies made it less appealing to me. Mr. Freeman was given one year and one day, but he never got a chance to do his time. His lawyer or someone got him released that very afternoon. In the living room, where the shades were drawn for coolness, Bailey and I played Monopoly on the floor. I played a bad game because I was thinking about how I would be able to tell Bailey. I was thinking about how I would be able to tell Bailey how I had lied and even worse for our relationship, kept a secret from him about Mr. Bailey, about Mr. Freeman touching me before the rape. Bailey answered the doorbell because grandmother was in the kitchen. A tall white policeman asked for Mr. Ba Mrs. Baxter. They had found out about the lie. Oh no. Maybe the policeman was coming to put me in jail because I had sworn on the Bible that everything I said would be the truth, the whole truth, so help me God. The man in our living room was taller than the sky and wider than the image of God. He didn't have to, he didn't have the beard. Mrs. Baxter, I thought you ought to know. Freeman's been found dead on the lot behind the slaughterhouse. Softly, as if she were discussing a church program, she said, poor man. She wiped her hands on the dish towel and just softly asked, do you know who did it? The policeman said, seems like he was dropped there. Some say he was kicked to death. Grandmother's color only rose a little. Tom, thank you for telling me, poor man. Well, maybe it's better this way. He was a mad dog. Would you like a glass of lemonade or some beer? Although he looked harmless, I knew he was a dreadful angel counting out my many sins. No thanks, Miss Baxter. I'm on duty. Gotta be getting back. And he tipped his hat. Well, tell your ma that I'll be over there when I take up my beer. Remind her to save me some kraut for me. And the recording angel was gone. He was gone. A man was dead because I had lied. Where was the balance in that? One lie surely wouldn't be worth a man's life. All right, let me just make it clear for the people who maybe are coming here late. She didn't lie about being raped. She felt guilty about Mr. Freeman hugging her and basically molesting her before the rape. So hugging her, ejaculating on her, humping on her and all that. So she said that the rape was the first time he touched her. And so she feels really bad about lying. Um, where was the balance in that? One lie surely wouldn't be worth a man's life. Bailey could have explained it all to me, but I didn't dare ask him. Obviously, I had forfeited my place in heaven forever, and I was a gut, as gutless. I was as gutless as the doll I had ripped to pieces ages ago. Even Christ himself turned his back on Satan. Wouldn't he turn his back on me? I could feel the evilness flowing through my body and waiting, pent up, to rush off my tongue if I tried to open my mouth. I clamped my teeth shut. I'd hold it in. If it escaped, wouldn't it flood the whole world with innocent people in it? Grandmother Baxter said, Reedy and Junior, you didn't hear a thing. I never want to hear this situation nor the evil man's name mentioned in my house again. I mean that. She went back into the kitchen to make apple strudel for my celebration. Even Bailey was frightened. He sat all to himself looking at a man's death, a kitten looking at a wolf. Not quite understanding it, but frightened all the same. In those moments, I decided that although Bailey loved me, he couldn't help me. I had sold myself to the devil, and there could be no escape. The only thing I could do was stop talking to people other than Bailey. Instinctively or somehow, I knew that because I loved him so much I'd never hurt him, but if I talked to anyone else, that person might die too. Just my breath carrying my words out might even poison people, and they'd curl up and die like that, like a black fat slug, like black fat slugs that only pretended. 
All right, that didn't make sense. Just my breath carrying out my words might poison people and they curl up and die like the black fat slugs that only pretended. Okay. I had to stop talking. I discovered that to achieve perfect personal silence, all I had to do was attach myself leech-like to sound. I began to listen to everything. I began to listen to everything. I lost my space. I, I began to listen to everything. I probably hoped that after I had heard all the sounds, really, really heard them and packed them down deep in my ears, the world would be quiet around me. I walked into rooms where people were laughing, their voices hitting the walls like stones, and I simply stood still in the middle of the riot sound. After a minute or two, silence would rush into the room from its hiding place because I had eaten up all the sounds. In the first weeks, my family accepted my behavior as post-rape, post-hospital, post-affliction. Neither the term nor their experience was mentioned in my grandmother's house where Bailey and I were staying again. They understood that I could talk to Bailey, but no one else. Then came the last visit from the visiting nurse, and the doctor said I was healed. That meant that I should be back on the sidewalks playing handball or enjoying the games I had been given when I was sick. When I refused to be a child, they knew and accepted when I refused to be the child they knew and accepted me to be, I was called impudent and mute and sullenness. For a while, I was punished for being so uppity that I wouldn't speak. And then came the thrashings given by any relative who felt themselves offended because I didn't speak to them. We were on the train going back to Stamps, and this time it was I who had to console Bailey. He cried his heart out down the aisles of the coach and pressed his little boy body against the window pane, looking for a last glimpse of his mother dear. I have never known if Mama sent for us or if St. Louis family just got fed up with my grim presence. There is nothing more appalling than a constantly morose child. I cared less about the trip than about the fact that Bailey was unhappy and had no more thought of our destination than if I had simply been headed for the toilet. All right, I'll stop right there, y'all. That Those are... The last two readings have been hard to hear, I'm sure hard to hear and hard to read. Um, and I hope, I don't know, I guess hope for the adults who are listening to, I don't know, just have an understanding of a child who has been harmed and what the manifestations of that might be um, that come out in the children. And uh, I feel sad that she was beaten for not talking instead of like, people trying to understand how that might be a manifestation of her harm and um and yeah and then sometimes things never get told right so then when children make sudden changes of personality then we have to pay attention to that and and lovingly take care of that as opposed to punish them or be offended for not being spoken to at any rate, this is I Know Why the Caged Bird Sings, and looking forward to um, reading to y'all tomorrow.